Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm a big buff of the History Channel. When I get bored at night, I'm channel surfing. Um, I just watch stuff because I think the more you know about the past, you know, the more you can try to figure out where the future is going. And, and it's interesting to know that, uh, to uh, see that surgery or attempts at trying to cure maladies that human beings have uh, uh, goes back many thousands of years. 9,000 years ago, 7,000 BC, um, in Ukraine, uh, trepanation was drilling or making a burr hole in the head to release the evil humors. Whether you had a headache, maybe it gave you another headache, or to cure maladies. I mean, that's what was known back then. Um, and the ancient Egyptians, in the building of the pyramids, they, they did this actually with uh, a high degree of proficiency. In the embalming process, they knew to, to, to remove the brain, they could do the entire thing just through the nose. And neurosurgeons, as some of you may know, can do certain surgeries right through the nose while the patient is awake, while you're awake. Because your brain actually doesn't have <laughs> sensory, just like your skin does. Um, and the, uh, there's a picture I'll show you of what's called the Edwin Smith papyrus that was discovered. It's, uh, it's in hieroglyphics, but it was the first surgical manual text, kind of like a, a residency uh, manual of uh, teaching surgery. And in many cultures, uh, you know, in India, 400 BC, uh, uh, Shishruta was called the father, father of surgery. Uh, in, in ancient um, Greece, you had Hippocrates and Galen, and these are names of surgeons that, that we learn in medical school as a history of medicine, of who started to think about the human body, dissection, knowing what the insides are like, how you can fix problems. Um, in the medieval times, the dark ages obviously, there was a decline in surgery because tools were limited. Often it was the barbers and monks, barbers because they had easy access to the blade. And they did minor surgical procedures. Sometimes in times of war, they would take the barber along with them uh, to, you know, in case there was a problem on the, uh, with the soldier, amputation, with the, with the blade. Um, physicians at that point slowly started to gain higher status uh, because of their knowledge of how to um, uh, treat, treat ailments and to, and to, and to operate. Um, Rogerius uh, Salernitus in 1180 AD is, uh, uh, published this, the Shirajai Surgery, the Manual of Surgery. Um, and back then it was really amputations, draining abscesses, um, uh, removing or uh, scarification. Bloodletting was felt to be curative. So you could cut yourself to relieve blood or put leeches on to suck the blood out. Um, and uh, these were felt to uh, uh, cure certain maladies with, with the, the theory of the evil humors, you know, because there were four humors, bile and blood and things like that. Um, uh, Ambrose Parr in France, John Hunter, Scotland. So evolution of surgical techniques continue. And now you start to get to names that may be more familiar. Louis Pasteur in France, as you know from pasteurization, he, he really advanced the field of microbiology. Because until then, we didn't understand that bugs that you could not see, bacteria, were a cause of a lot of problems. Um, and so that was the start of germ theory. And along the same time, a, uh, an Austrian-German, Ignaz Semmelweis, showed that just by washing hands in a mother-baby ward, just by washing hands with soap, reduced the number of deaths of moms and babies, just because of uh, you know, lowering the germ uh, um, burden on the, on the patient. Joseph Lister took this to the next level. I'm sure that name's familiar because, yes, I just heard someone say Listerine, and, and uh, that's probably why they picked that. And, and you know, he, he, was, he was called the father of modern antisepsis. He, uh, carbolic acid, uh, also known as phenol, he used that to sterilize wounds and to clean the surgical tools and instruments before operating. And that started the modern era. And he actually, in 1902, operated on King Edward VII in England, uh, who had appendicitis. And he survived. Because at that time, even a simple surgery like appendix or gallbladder often meant you didn't die of the surgery, but you died of the infection afterwards. So he survived. And uh, you know, he, he said that, I know that if it had not been for you and your work, I would not have been sitting here today. So he was thankful for that. Um, 
A Boston dentist, Morton, first used ether to knock people out and started anesthesia. So Halstead, <coughs> William Halstead is, uh, you know, uh, re regarded uh, by many as, as, as kind of like the father of, of, of modern surgery. He was the first one to start a surgical residency program at Johns Hopkins. That's what made Hopkins so famous. And he, he you know, lots, of, lots of, uh, of, of inventions along the way of things that we take for granted, sterile gloves, a new surgery based on anatomy and physiology, uh, studying animals to see uh, you know, how we can benefit from dissecting uh, pigs and monkeys. Um, modern operating room theater, which I'm sure, I don't know if you have uh, seen that episode of Seinfeld. Uh, uh, <laughs> where, yeah, where the candy uh, pops out. What was it? A milk debt or something like that? Or uh, oh, all right. And uh, but the he started the residency scheme of training surgeons. And uh, and at that time in the in the late 1800s, you just had a bunch of surgeons now doing the first of many surgeries. Uh, gastrectomy was the removal of the stomach for cancer, um, gallbladder, and appendix. Um, this is that papyrus from 11 AD, uh, from, from uh, well, it's 1600 BC is the date, but it was purchased by uh, somebody in the 18th, uh, uh, 1850, and they, it, it, that's the name that it gave it to. Uh, but it's, you know, these are not the surgical manuals that we have to read and study, but it's interesting how far back just the training of surgeons go to. So, as a cardiologist, you may be wondering, well, why am I talking about the history of medicine and the history of surgery? Because it's important to know all the things that have come. And there's the operating room theater, which looked like this when they operated with people watching. Um, and, um, and, and that was in Hopkins. And that's what we have now today. That's a common operating room in any hospital that you'll see uh, with, with all the technology pieces that we take for granted now. And, uh, and like uh, uh, Dr. Mead and Dr. Lucchetti said, you know, you just expect to get in and get out and not have any complications, wake up, you know, from anesthesia. This is real and this is what the future OR will look like where, where it's similar but you get these fancy, this kind of like a C arm which can do angiography and x-rays at the same time you're doing surgery. So um, this is the, uh, the high end, what they call a hybrid OR where you could do anything from a catheterization to a full surgery if necessary. Um, so modern surgery was founded on these four important legs of anatomy, anesthesia, understanding how <laughs> blood clotting uh, works to stop bleeding, and concepts of asepsis, which is the Listerine concept of, you know, of uh, keeping things clean and germ-free. And so this 20th century, the last 100 years, has, you know, it's, th things have taken off. It's hard to, it's hard to keep up. It's hard for a medical student, a resident, to learn all of what we have done in the past hundred years and so therefore we have to specialize. But understanding of shock, what happens when you lose too much blood? What happens when you get too much infection in your body? Uh, blood transfusion, how blood clots, antibiotics, analgesics for pain. Then you have electrically powered surgical instruments, stapling, uh, surgical glues and tapes, um, and x-rays and scans. Now it's, many of you know, it's gone on to even more things. Cryogenic supercooled probes using liquid nitrogen to freeze or burn something. You can actually burn something by freezing it too cold because if you ever get liquid nitrogen on your skin, it feels like you're having a burn. Um, ultrasound devices, medical lasers, heart-lung bypass machine, hypothermia gets your temperature down so you have less injury to the brain during a, uh, a, a surgery or procedure. Cementing substances, bone joint replacements, micro minimally invasive surgery, and then vascular imaging and angioplasty. So here's the, here's the switch. So that's what the past hundred or so years have given us, which is a tremendous adv you know, um, um, advancement in medicine and surgical techniques. But now there's a shift that's occurring. Over the last 20 to 30 years, we're realizing that not everything can just be cut and removed or replaced because a lot of things happen on a test tube biology level. Um, microbiology, uh, biochemistry, disorders of function that you can't just replace, for example, just as easy as a joint replacement. You could have uh, inflammation if you have a rheumatologic condition like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's. 
ischemia infarction can be anywhere from a stroke to a heart attack to a leg amputation. Metabolic disorders are diabetes. That's, that's probably the most common and biggest metabolic disorder that's out there. Cancer, neoplasia, cysts, hypertrophy. So now you're getting into test tube. It's like back into the microscopy of things. So what that's leading healthcare and the future of healthcare is back kind of away from the OR again. It's taking it from the invasive OR to the non-invasive. And we've known that we can do things without having to cut somebody open. Uh, I'm sure some time back if you had a large kidney stone, you had to have surgery to remove it. Then they realized that you can break it up with ultrasound, which is lithotripsy. Um, and then you can just pee it out. Painful, but you can pee it out. Uh, radiation, gamma knife, without even having to cut the skull, you can use a gamma, which is a radiation form, to cut actually tissue inside the skull to do something to, say, a brain tumor uh, without having to even cut the person open or to cut the uh, skull open. Seed implants for, 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 say, prostate cancer and other types of cancer. Uh, and minimally, uh, minimal surgery with minimally invasive techniques where you just make small port holes, laparoscopy. VATS, video assisted thoracoscopy techniques which you can just go in and remove a lump or a mass with just small portholes. This has led to the um, endoscopy, any place you can put a scope down, including inside a blood vessel leading to cardiac catheterization, arterial, venous, and we'll look at some of the venous things that we do. And then you can block off abnormal blood vessels to try to kill tumors, for example, or to close off varicose veins that, that are problematic that you can't fix. Um, and superglue, some of you may know, have, has been used for a long time, actually, for decades. Um, you can suture kids' cuts with superglue and just because kids don't tolerate having a stitch there and they're going to play with it. Um, a scalp incision, it's hard to stitch. It's easier to just superglue it. Uh, they have superglued um, aneurysms inside the brain, shut them down. They have superglued tumors inside uh, 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 livers, um, um, ovarian conditions, and now we're using it uh, to, to close off varicose veins. Um, coils are another way to do the same thing. Ablation is a term, it just means to knock out, get rid of. And you can do it with any technique. Most common ablation is with heat, so it's thermal. Anything that'll heat up a catheter using laser or ultrasound. Radio frequency is the fancy word for microwave. That's why you don't put a spoon in the microwave oven because it'll, it'll heat up and it'll start sparking on you. But we do that on purpose with a catheter to take it up to about 250 degrees to purposely burn a vein. But you can also burn something by freezing it because once you get tissue under minus 40 degrees Celsius, it you create a ball of ice, the shards of ice inside the cells actually spike it to death. So you can actually kill tissue that way. Um, so there's a trial in cardiology called fire and ice, meaning that you can treat atrial fibrillation with either a hot probe or liquid CO2, uh, liquid nitrogen to try to burn this, that same tissue. So just like Dr. Uh, Mead and Dr. Lucchetti said, What's this all leading to? Well, it's faster recovery and decreased cost. There's going to be a tremendous pressure on the whole country as we all age and try to reduce the cost of everything. Um, th th that's a national mandate, uh, regardless of uh, you know, who's in charge of Congress or whatever, dollars are dollars. So all of these same things that we talked about get you out of the hospital faster, makes more things outpatient instead of inpatient and also reduces the cost. Um, and getting into the molecular, back into the tiny again, things we cannot see, the understanding of, of the, the more recent scientific advances, well, why is heart surgery less now? Well, if you, the second one, antiplatelets, we actually have less heart attacks, less severe heart attacks because of use of drugs like aspirin and Plavix. These are antiplatelets because we're learning that if you can make the blood slick, like putting WD-40 into a system, it doesn't matter if you have a blockage, as long as the blood flows across the blockage. You just don't want something to get stuck in a pipe. That's when you have a stroke or a heart attack or some other problem. So you don't necessarily have to fix the blockage. You could live to 100 with a blockage. 
So it's the quality of life that's becoming more important. So antiplatelets have shown that you can do that with uh, treat heart attacks, stents, and strokes that way. Anticoagulants, the old warfarin, rat poison, Coumadin. Now there are newer drugs uh, like Xeralto and Eliquis and Pradaxa. You've seen the TV ads uh, for, for atrial fibrillation. Even fancier things, uh, well, statins, they've had a pro and con. They've, you know, people can have side effects, but statins ha have actually reduced the rates of heart attacks and stroke here in the country over the last 10 to 20 years. When I was training at the University of Pittsburgh for my cardiology fellowship, we used to see the, the degree and severity and frequency of heart attacks every night, Friday night, Saturday night. It, it didn't matter if it was Christmas, Thanksgiving, or New Year. It was just like nonstop. We were just up all night. We just don't see that degree of of cardiovascular or type of stroke anymore because I think the medical therapies have stabilized a lot of, a lot of those conditions. And the immunobiologics, you know, like the Humeras, um, uh, treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, treatment of Crohn's, psoriasis, um, they've taken it to the next level. And that's also another reason why surgery is down because way back in the day or probably in other parts of the world, if your Crohn's, bless you, if your Crohn's went nuts on you, then you had to have surgery in your intestine, the distal ileum. Uh, uh, the, now we just don't see as much of that with, with these uh, new therapies. Um, the immunosuppressants for transplants, and of course the antivirals and the antibiotics. Um, so the theme of the history of medicine is that medical advances are basically leading to less surgery because of molecular and biologic advances. And whatever we do is becoming more outpatient, which is all, you know, it has a positive uh, uh, you know, effect for all of us. It's a faster recovery and uh, lower cost. So some of the things that we uh, do here from a cardiovascular standpoint is just to focus on the leg and vascular, a lot of, a lot of um, uh, parts go into making your leg work properly from bones and muscles and tendons and nerves and the blood supplies. To focus on the blood supply, <clears throat> blood goes down to our legs through arteries. That's the high pressure system. It's just like an HVAC system, high pressure system. And then the return is the low pressure. Um, the return are through healthy veins. And you can see the picture of uh, a vein in a leg <coughs> that a healthy vein, interestingly, has valves in it. it it's it's, it's kind of neat to think that our body is engineered with these uh, with, with, with valves in the veins, because otherwise all the blood would fall down and all of our legs would be swollen at the end of the day. When they're working, the blood flows up, valve closes, and does not fall down. Uh, that's, that's the arrow pointing up. Over time, veins can get dilated and develop reflux. The valves don't check anymore. It's like a one-way valve. And then the blood starts falling down. And what happens then? You start to getting varicose veins. Your legs hurt. They're restless at night. Um, you get what's called venous claudication, where you don't feel like walking in a mall because the moment you get up and start, you have to sit down on the bench for a little bit because your legs are heavy. Um, and if you wait long enough, the skin starts to change because the circulation's not, not good and you can start to get ulcers, which can then threaten the limb. And so here's some of the pictures. And I'm sure that you've seen people or you know family or friends with, with legs that may look like this. Um, whether they have varicose veins. These are the people I tell uh, that wear the pants out, you know, at the beach because they they're conscious about not wanting to uh, expose their legs. But you get varicose veins from it. You can see that, uh, that, that one patient's left leg is swollen. It can be one-sided, both-sided, you know, either or. It doesn't have to be equally on both sides. And you can start to get those skin changes. And it's like this tanning, kind of like a leather sort of like a baseball glove because there is a, the circulation is poor and the skin thickens and becomes more like parchment-like and you get that dark coloration. And then if you bump your legs, you get a venous ulcer that, that takes a long time to heal. Um, of course, a lot of things happen with age. Um, women are a bit more at risk for this, probably because of history of uh, uh, um, childbearing because uh, it puts pressure on the pelvic veins. Uh, family history is strong. Um, if you're overweight, if you have a profession that you're standing, that's like almost all of us. Uh, whether you're a, a physician, 
or a nurse or a hairdresser or a cashier or even a pen dot worker. Uh, you know, it's just, we're standing all the time. Um, and if you have history of blood clots or DVTs, they can damage those veins and cause the same problem. We diagnose it with an ultrasound. Uh, once, once we uh, see this abnormal flow in the vein, in combination with the history and physical, we can go into these veins. This is like uh, a plumbing technique where we can snake the vein with a catheter. And as we pull the catheter back, it's done through the skin, what we call percutaneous. The same day, you're awake for the procedure, we numb up your leg with lidocaine. That's the equipment. Either you could put a, that closure fast is the catheter on the right. It has a tip that's about seven centimeters long that heats up through microwave, that's radio frequency. And, you, and, and that actually burns the vein closed. The picture on the bottom is, is showing you what looks like a, uh, kind of like a, a glue gun. That's exactly what it is. And what you're doing is you're putting super glue through that glue gun. Think of how you uh, put like a bead of caulk on a bathroom sill or something like that, except you're actually filling the vein with that stuff and you're closing the pipe up that way. It doesn't matter how you close it, whether you burn it, damage it. For years, 50 plus years, surgeons did stripping of the veins. And I've had ladies tell me that, yeah, doc, I had that done in 1968, and I had my left leg done and never went back for the right leg because it took like two weeks to heal, a lot of bruising, uh, scars left over from that. So this is one of the reasons why we're doing less surgery because we have minimally invasive techniques to take care of the same thing. Um, just a couple more slides to wrap up here is, um, you know, that almost anything that was done surgically, you know, triple A, which is an abdominal aortic aneurysm, it's a big problem, it's a severe problem. Uh, it was one of the most um, challenging and high risk surgeries that were performed because whenever you do a vascular surgery on the body's largest blood vessel, the aorta, the body does not like it, obviously. So it, there was a high morbidity and mortality associated with these surgeries. But now you can do what's called a stent graft. You can go in through the femoral arteries on both groins and deploy this thing that looks like a sleeve. All you need to do is to kind of line the inside, like a can sleeve inside another can, and it will stop that aneurysm from expanding and reduce the risk of rupture, because that's the ultimate goal, because if that thing ruptures, you're not going to be around for more than about two minutes. Um, similar to that, in cardiology, uh, the cardiothoracic surgeons at one point thought that they're going to be a dying breed because, uh, you know, stents, cardiac catheterization, we can go into the heart, and that's what a cardiac catheterization looks like. That's a normal left side of the heart. The shadow that you see here Th this is the whole heart right there in the chest. And some of these lines coming across, like these bands, those are the ribs. So when we put a catheter up through the leg or in through the arm, and you can see the catheter seated into the left main coronary, and when you inject the dye and you take a picture, that's what uh, normal cardiac catheterization in coronaries look like. If you have a blockage or a pinch, sort of looks like the waist of like an hourglass, you can see that, and then they can deploy a stent that reduced the need for bypass surgery, big time. Um, now we have techniques where you can actually use the same technique to replace a valve. I'm sure you are aware that TAVR is, is there. It's not, it's not a new thing anymore. You know, uh, all the regional hospitals are doing it. Uh, at, at, at first it was only available like in New York or Philly. Uh, but TAVR is putting an aortic valve. We never thought it was possible to replace your aortic valve. It's a technique where you actually put something in like say if a door is stuck, imagine putting a skinny umbrella into the door and popping it open and coming out. Now the door is open and what you left is, is, is a new valve that's opening and closing. Um, you kind of crush the old door, but in elderly patients, particularly those that are 80 and older, they tolerate Tavar much better than having your chest cracked and go under anesthesia for six hours. So that's also cutting down the need for um, cardiac surgery. You can get a cardiac catheterization equivalent without even doing a cardiac catheterization now. Um, insurance won't always cover this, but 
some, uh, you know, this is a CAT scan. This is a, a really fancy high-end CAT scan. A CAT scan is just x-ray. Um, to get pictures like this, you have to take an x-ray picture really fast, like a camera with a very high shutter speed. If you're taking a picture of an athlete on a field, you've got to have a high shutter speed, otherwise the picture is going to be blurry and you won't be able to see these crisp details. The heart's moving. Every second it's doing this. So you have to have a, a, a newer CAT scan that can take like high shutter speed shots and line them up to actually, and you can tell if you have a blockage without it having to go inside. Um, and then on the far left you have a uh, PET scan is a type of nuclear scan. Um, it's not quite like your dog or cat pet, but it's um, positon, positron emission te you know, uh, uh, technologies. What the nuclear goes into different cells and it kind of glows in a way. The camera can see it. You and I can't see it with the naked eye. Then if you take a CAT scan, with this X which is done with x-ray, so this is physiology, blood flowing to different places. That's anatomy, just like a picture, like a snapshot. You can fuse the two to create a PET CT image to do specialized surgery, find which, say, say if you have two lumps in your lungs, one is cancerous, one is not, you can tell which one needs to be removed. If you just do a CAT scan, you can't tell, but then if you fuse it with a PET scan, you can see which one is the bad one. And uh, so, and, and these are the technologies that are actively uh, here that have reduced the need for surgery. Where's this all going? Who knows? But this is actually stuff that's out here, so I just thought it would be kind of neat to wrap up with Will this be the future where your dentist will be that robot? <laughs> they actually have these robots, you know? I mean, it sounds, it sounds kind of funny, but we know that uh, uh, Hondas and Toyotas are, spot welds are done by robot arms with much higher accuracy and reproducibility than a human being. And they work 24-7 without complaining. <laughs> so, and, so they're just using that Right, and using that technology to, and of course there will always be an operator nearby to control things. Maybe that'll be your doctor of the future. <laughs> yeah, you know, with, with this, all this talk about AI and technology, where is this going? Well, you know, you've seen um, TV ads for IBM. They have the system called Watson. Watson's played Jeopardy and won Jeopardy. Watson's played chess grandmasters and beat them, so... It's only a matter of time, and, and they're trying to actually use Watson to say, well, Watson has been shown to come up with a diagnosis in the emergency department better than most physicians. Right, right. Right, if they, you know, if we're all replaced by Watson or, or this robot, we just have to figure out what we're going to do in our spare time. <laughs> That's actually the, the, the real challenge of how not to get bored and stay active. Stryker uh, advertises and promotes <coughs> robotics. Is anybody around here doing robotic cart surgery or surgery? Yeah, there is, there, is, there is a Da Vinci robot system that's been in use for some time. Um, around here? Yeah. Uh, St. Luke's, Lehigh Valley um, uh, for prostate and other types of uh, surgery. And so the, the future could be that you're going to be operated on by robotic arms like this. But what the real system actually looks like this. So there's a patient draped, and that's the abdomen. And there's robots one, two, and three instead of surgical tech one, two, and three. But these are much more accurate. And interestingly, these universal joints that are here, they can move in seven degrees of freedom better than the human wrist can without the tremor. Because a neurosurgeon has to know that you, you, a neurosurgeon cannot operate on something that, that's big in a critical part of your brain if you have a shaky hand. So these hands never shake. What would it do for physicians? I have no idea. I mean, you know, the only ones are being replaced. <laughs> that's a good question. That's a good question. They can just walk around and watch and make sure. Well, there will be a role. I think, I think, I think that yeah, I, obviously, you know, we're not going to be 100% replaced, but this is actually around. So these robotic arms are being controlled by these two physicians with special gloves and hands. You shouldn't be worried. You could give up your day job and teach history. This is great stuff. Yeah, and, and, and it's actually nice for me to do this because it also gives me a sense of, you know, uh, from 
thousands of years ago to modern surgery from 1880s till now, and now things are changing in a different kind of way. I thought it was like five years ago. That's it. You know, time flies. It was 2001, actually, 17 years ago, that they used this kind of a system where the patient needed a gallbladder removed. I, I think it was the appendix. Um, appendectomy or cholecystectomy on a patient. The patient was lying in New York City in a hospital. The surgeons were in France. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. You may have caught the news. And of course, next to the patient, there was a team standing by should something break down and jump in. But they were able to do the entire surgery uh, with, with operators in France through fiber optic cables uh, that, that, that gave very reliable um, Wi-Fi or internet connection. Um, and so this has, this has interesting implications of Maybe you can uh, you know, give surgeries to remote towns where people don't get medical care that you can have a standby team. Not that it's necessarily going to replace the physicians at you know, here or NYU or Penn, but, and also it has very interesting um, applications in the military. In the war field, if somebody is down and bleeding, you could send a robot out there. They actually have these things that the Army is working on. You could send a robot out there that just kind of grabs that person's legs, sucks them in, and then the robot just starts doing stuff, and the operators are somewhere else safe and can start operating, give epi, tie off a blood clot, and start you know, just to save a life. So there's lots of neat things.